thank you all for being here and spending some time with us today to listen about codifying transmission, containment, and prevention. We will hear from Dr. Gar and Erica Umeokene. And Alliant, as a reminder, is the quality improvement organization for the seven states listed here on this slide. And as I mentioned, Dr. Gar is one of our presenters. She is the medical director for nursing facilities within North, Northeast Georgia, excuse me, and she's our medical director here at Alliant. And Erica is on our patient safety team and she is one of our infection preventionists. And Dr. Gar, the floor is yours. Thank you. So today it's a packed session, but I um, we have um, cases that we have seen in long-term care and we are going to literally go through them and I can say very comfortably, I think one of, you know, a few of these cases you may have seen during, um, you know, in your nursing homes, um, especially right now. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is understanding the importance of implementing transmission-based precautions to prevent the spread of pathogens. Um, and different pathogens and describe practical aspects for promptly identifying and containing infectious path pathogens in the facilities before everything spreads. And then discuss the containment strategies to limit transmission. In the nursing home, we'll talk about the resources um, that you can have, you will have access to at the end of this talk, which are super important. I was just talking to Erica and I was like, I just looked at it this morning, you know? Um, so they are that important. Uh, and then highlight lessons learned from COVID-19 that apply to other transmission-based practices, right? So we're gonna talk about this and I just wanted to set this up. So we had a talk that we were gonna, um, it, that we were gonna give today, but I had cases that I wanted to bring in because these are the cases that we see in long-term care facilities. And what I have seen is that, you know, we are sort of kind of getting comfortable taking care of COVID um, outbreaks, um, you know, and understanding the principles. But then you have other cases that may be happening and there is a theme to it. So today we're going to really talk about that basic theme or the basic format that we need to follow and you can layer any infection on it, right? You can talk about COVID, you can RSV, you can talk about flu, you can talk about norovirus infection, diarrhea, um, C. diff, other infections, even skin infections. So what we did is we divided this talk into two. So today we're gonna talk about two different kinds of infections. And then when you come back the next month, we're gonna talk about skin infections and, and kind of see how the same principles follow. So we're gonna take a set of principles and we're gonna apply it to all these different infections to make sure that we're dealing with it the right way. So let's jump into this case study. The DON observes the staff having sinus allergies in the morning meeting. The next day, two other staff members are having sniffles and sore throat and it is very cold outside. This may or may not be happening in your facilities now. Weekend covering position is called for a temperature of 99 degrees Fahrenheit or a resident. Um, they are also having chills and the resident doesn't wanna get out of bed. The urine is sent and the resident gets started on antibiotics or UTI because that we had never heard before. Um, the next day, Three residents in the hall develop runny noses, headaches, and two more develop fevers and chills. Um, the doctor now orders COVID tests and the rapids are positive, the rapid is positive. And now there is that widespread testing of residents and staff in the hallway. 12 staff members and 20 residents test positive for COVID-19. So, this is a case that we are, these are the kind of cases that we are seeing now in COVID that now we're no longer, you know, now we are supposed to kind of work this in our facilities, in our head, because, you know, the CMS um, guidance, um, strict guidance on how you are going to process these positive cases or how you're going to do surveillance and everything has gone away, right? 
And now what do we do with that? So I am, so the first thing that you need to do, right? The first thing that needs to happen is understanding that when, when people are having sinus allergies or, you know, in, in the, in the time when you, in, in this time when the COVID um, flu and RSV season is around right now, and, you know, hopefully we're all looking at COVID uh, data tracker, CDC data tracker at some point, you know, on a weekly basis and seeing what is happening in our communities, that sinus allergies or these allergies that the staff are coming in with should not be just taken as, oh, yes, this is a total established diagnosis. And instead, let's get into that inquiry mode and say, can we test you in, right? Um, but also, an important piece of this is when this all is happening, your infection preventionist needs to take charge and then she or he will need to do what they need to do. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erica, who is, you know, who's gonna talk about the infection prevention piece as an infection preventionist. Thank you so much, Dr. Gar. I think you really highlighted something here, especially from an infection prevention and control standpoint is how high is your suspicion for an infection, an infectious pathogen coming into your facility? And when that threshold or that concern is met in terms of suspicion, what are you doing on a daily basis to help reduce the risk of that happening? And then also what are you doing um, in the event that you find out information that confirms or um, further validates your degree of suspicion. And so we'll talk about that in the context of standard precautions and also transmission-based precautions. And then again, just walk through those practical steps of just how to make sure that you're identifying your risk of uh, infection path infectious pathogens, how you're containing them and how you're managing all of your IPC practices in the meantime. So let's just start with standard precautions. And I know a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but I really wanna contextualize this in this context. So standard precautions are a core component of infection prevention, of any infection prevention and control program. And of course they promote healthcare personnel and resident safety. And to be honest, it's something that every healthcare personnel should adhere to and be practicing on a daily basis. So of course, you know, you've heard that standard precautions actually um, you know, you should be used in the context of, you know, assuming basically that every person that you potentially encounter is potentially infected or colonized, especially if they're a resident and they're living in a long-term care setting and have all these potentially other risk factors that would likely um, uh, increase the probability of them being infected or colonized with something. But nonetheless, standard precautions just assumes that across the board. And it Thus, should require staff uh, to implement interventions to uh, not only protect themselves, but also to protect residents. And this can be done especially in the, with effective use of personal protective qu equipment, especially when there's an anticipation of contact with blood or body fluids or se secretions or lesions or non-intact skin and those kind of scenarios. Um, of course, standard precautions also includes hand hygiene, again, the proper use of PPE, safe injection practices, respiratory hygiene, and cough etiquette, environmental cleaning and disinfection, and then the safe handling of textiles and laundry. Now, when we talk about transmission-based precautions, that's a step up. So transmission-based precautions, or TBP, are used in addition to standard precautions for patients with known or suspected infection or colonization. And under, I just wanna underscore, TBP is used with known or suspected infection or colonization with a transmissible and or epidemiologically significant infection, infectious agent or pathogen. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, kind of um, how you might be able to differentiate a uh, pathogen versus a clinical syndrome, or just again, kind of validate that high level of suspicion so that way you can take appropriate action. Um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, TBP could basically be divided up or categorized into three main components. So there's contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. Contact precautions, um, 
actually are intended to prevent contact transmission, which uh, contact transmission is actually one of the most common modes of how pathogens are transmitted. And so contact precautions are um, helpful to prevent the transmission of those infectious agents, especially when they're spread by direct and indirect, con indirect contact with the resident or the resident's environment. Droplet precautions are intended to prevent transmission of pathogens spread through close respiratory or mucous membrane contact, especially with respiratory secretions. And then airborne precautions uh, prevent transmission of infectious agents that typically remain infectious over long distances and, and are often suspended in the air. And of course, we're you know familiar with most um, most familiar with TB and measles and whatnot. And then of course with droplet examples of that will be influenza, RSV, and uh, contact your. MDROs, your multi-drug resistant organisms typically fall in those categories. Now, there are some other uh, subcategories related to TBP, like enhanced barrier precautions, which is specifically used in a nursing home setting and refers to use of PPE, um, especially spe specifically the use of gown and gloves through, with high contact resident care activities that uh, often provide opportunities for the transfer of multi-drug resistant organisms from staff to uh, hands and clothing. Um, to and from the residents. And then lastly, enteric precautions are very similar to contact precautions, but there's often use for GI-related pathogens or gastrointestinal type pathogens um, that are easily spread through, you know, hand and, and contact. And so with these type of enteric precautions, um, again, it's like contact precautions, but it has a special emphasis on hand hygiene, specifically hand washing after contact with the resident or the resident's environment. Now, again, um, different facilities might have varying titles, but overall it's still the same in these three categories, contact, droplet, and airborne. So now let's get to like the really important parts of this conversation. So it's very important that we understand, you know, just easy ways that we can effectively implement transmission-based precautions in our facility. And so we provided four steps here um, and just something you can, again, just think about. So first you need to identify the pathogen or clinical syndrome. You need to, in, you need to initiate containment, which is basically the implementation of TBP. Just the containment is TBP. It helps prevent transmission and it also helps contain it to uh, the resident's environment and uh, in the clinical scenario and the situation that's uh, going on. Then you need to determine the extent of transmission and, you know, basically determining how it's spread or if there's any other risk to any other individuals in your facility. And then you need to continue to coordinate ongoing prevention activities through policies, procedures, et cetera. And we're going to talk in depth about each one of these. And I just want to take a moment to see if Dr. Gar has anything to add before we jump into the, the steps. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is... Uh... This is something that you know, it's such, it, this is really the basis of, you know, how we approach things, right? In this case example that I had, identifying the clinical syndrome to kind of say that, you know, yes, this could be something that might be going on leads to that early identification. So having that low threshold for suspicion um, of, you know, respiratory illness, for example, right now, which is the season for respiratory illness, right? Um, and then a, a quickly identifying that, you know, any kind of sniffles or sinus allergies, I'm going to have to check because the risk of spread is super high if it actually was COVID, yeah, right? Uh, or even flu or RSV. So that is important. And then as soon as you have established that there is something going on in your building, First thing is literally, you know, if you remember that ad from, you know, one of the leading, you know, uh, paper towel, uh, paper towels, right? You have a spill, you got to contain it. So put all these measures, don't wait until, uh, you know, the, the, um, the um, diagnosis is like established, right? You don't want to wait until that PCR goes in and now is testing positive you may have 10 more cases. The first thing you're gonna do is contain that spell. And you know that's how I think as a medical director is you gotta contain that spell. Put people in, you know, put the isolation signs up, stop, stop the spread first, and then figure out the transmission. And um, Erica is gonna go over that transmission piece of it, but map it, map it, map it. If you're an infection preventionist, you got to have your facility map 
you know, even rough copies of your facility map on which you are basically making these little crosses and, you know, kind of saying, this is the patient here and this is the patient here. Because I can tell you, if you tell me as a medical director, if I find out that there are two cases positive or four cases positive, it's it means different to me if those two cases or four cases are within the same staff assignment or the state, same hallway versus one case is on unit A and one case is on unit B because those mean totally different what, things and they are transmitted totally different ways, right? So you're, how you're going to contain it and how you're going to prepare for making sure that you are preventing further spread is going to be completely different. Thank you, Erica. Yes, thank you for that perspective. And you're absolutely right. And I think that just to highlight, you know, this is where the um, definitely the inter interdisciplinary collaboration comes into play, especially for the IP and especially for understanding your role in coordinating all of this um, to to happen and also through an administrative, st administrative standpoint and also through your daily work. So let's talk about identifying the pathogen. And this is very important. So when we talk about pathogen or clinical syndrome, so we're talking about um, pathogens, which are bacteria, fungi, protozoa, protozoa worms, or viruses that, again, cause infection in a host and, of course, a subsequent um, signs and symptoms. Um, in terms of clinical syndrome, this is a particular constellation of signs and symptoms that actually don't have a clear cause, but yet still may indicate an infection. So again, whether it's a confirmed, uh, it's confirmed the type of infection the resident may have, or if the resident has signs and symptoms that are indicative of a potential infection, you should go ahead and start thinking about, do I need to implement TBP? And also what's helpful when understanding and identifying your pathogen or even your clinical syndrome, you need to start thinking about the mode of transmission because the mode of transmission refers to how this potential pathogen might be spread from one person to the next, from one object to the next, or just in general in the environment. And then and also you need to consider the incubation period. And this is basically defined as the period between the time the individual will um, was exposed to someone who had an infection, and uh, it's, it's, and then they the appearance of the first symptoms in that that individual. So after they've been exposed, how long does it take for them to develop to develop signs and symptoms? And this is particularly important as you're thinking about the extent to which transmission might be potentially occurring occurring in your uh, facility. And to Dr. Gar's point, that's why mapping out um, what potential cases in your facility is so very important because you can also also, again, tie this in to identify the pathogen or just better understand how it's being transmitted um, in your facility and then, of course, contain it based on those transmission-based precautions and other interventions. Now, sometimes it's really hard to get some of this information, especially as a new IP. I found it very overwhelming um, just to try to better understand like what was going on, like what these infections, what pathogens were common in which infections, and even when that pathogen was identified, what should I do and how should I, um, you know, uh, 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 understand, again, how, to, how do I better understand this to make sure I'm implementing things correctly? So on the right side of your slide, you'll see three resources. Uh, Ready Reference for Microbes is an excellent resource that is, is a comprehensive resource that talks about all the different types of pathogens that you might see in a healthcare environment. And then, of course, your Infection Prevention Guide to Long-Term Care Facility through APIC, the Association for Professionals and in Infection Control, is an excellent resource, as well as the Control of Communicable Diseases Manual through the American Journal of Public, uh, the American Public Health Association. So all of these resources are available um, to uh, one extent or degree or another, um, probably through some professional organizations. But in, when you don't have access to those resources in your hand, I think the best thing to do is go to the CDC's website because they actually have a list of diseases and organisms that are quite common in healthcare settings that are also relevant to the resident population and in, in long-term care facility facilities. And so you see here all of these, um, these common or diseases and organisms have their own webpage. They, they talk about um, transmission, incubation periods, treatment options, and also how to further prevent infections in the facility. Um, the 
link for this resource or this web page is also hyperlinked at the bottom of your screen, so I encourage you to check that out. In addition to that, now one thing you should keep handy, like just have it as your infection prevention and control, um, just go to resource is the 2007 guideline for isolation precautions, which is basically the um, the the essential component to your IPC program when you're trying to prevent and contain organisms in your uh, uh, infectious organisms in your facility. Now, when I was an IP, um, I honestly initially printed out this entire thing. I, it was like 200 pages and I just had a binder with it in it. But as you become a more seasoned IP, you know, you could actually probably just print pages and whatnot that are relevant to what you need to do or how you, uh, what may be helpful as in, in terms of incorporating into your policy. So nonetheless, identifying pathogens and clinical syndromes, this is, this particular resource is very helpful for that. And again, it's hyperlinked on your, um, on the bottom of your slide here. I want to call out in this resource, although it's about 200 pages, if you uh, go all the way to appendix, appendix A, you'll find very, very helpful tables and figures that honestly I've used to, I literally printed out some of these tables and put them in my infection control transmission-based precautions policy. And that way it was in a policy where everyone in the facility had access to it to literally look up things like, um, you know, oh, I have, I'm concerned this uh, resident has diarrhea or has a clinical syndrome that it might be indicative of um, an infectious type of diarrhea. What should I do? Where should I go? And for example, here's where you would go. You would go to table two and you would get all of that information to again, better help um, uh, qualify what may be going on with your residents and then also um, identify how to better contain it. But again, all of these tables listed in this appendix are very, very helpful and I would really encourage you to look through them and also embed them if you can in your policy within your facilities. Um, now, <laughs> Dr. Gar also mentioned how she actually used this same uh, reference or this resource to um, look up RSV uh, precaution durations um, for a, a case in her facility. So it's very, very important, again, to be, to be aware of this. And not only can you use it to help identify a pathogen or clinical syndrome, you can then, again, use it to better understand how to contain it or implement transmission-based precautions. So again, going to go walk through a quick example. We're going to Appendix A. So if we open up Appendix A, you'll see, uh, again, options for how you could look up information. So this is the type and duration of precautions recommended for select infections and conditions. And I believe that was actually uh, in table... Um, Let's see, I think that was, yeah, actually the first part of Appendix A, um, where it has all the types of infections and conditions listed in alphabetical order. Oh, I do want to mention that although this was initially published in 2007, that it's routinely updated. I think the last update was actually in July of this year. So again, it's a, a excellent reference for you to not only print out, but also to have readily available electronically just to make sure that you're also not missing any updates that may have occurred. So if we walk through an example of a condition, so I have a resident who has a huge abscess that is not being not, you know, effectively contained with the dressing and it's um, draining a lot. What should I do? So the clinical syndrome or condition is a draining abscess. We need to consider implementing contact in, in addition to standard precautions for the duration of the illness or until drainage stops or can be contained by addressing. And this is just literally straight from this Appendix A. And again, I think it's just very helpful because it's something you can easily reference, you can pull um, information from, and it's evidence-based. And again, it's something that even in the event that you are not available at your facility, um, your staff, by if, if you embed this into your policy, could easily pull this up and be aware of what they should be doing potentially for these clinical syndromes. Now, if we talk about how do we contain a specific pathogen, so in this situation, um, we have uh, gastroenteritis caused by Clostridium uh, uh, difficile, so um, C. diff, and again, we have the type of precaution that is going to be needed, contact plus standard, and you're going to need that for the duration of the illness in addition to other considerations like, of course, designating equipment, ensuring environmental cleaning and disinfection, and hand washing with soap and water. So. 
it's such an easy reference to use and to effectively um, implement and even educate your staff with. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gar for our next case study. So, okay. So we talked about COVID, like clearly that was COVID. Um, but now we say, well, we're getting good at COVID, right? You know, we know that the transmission is fast. We got to come and contain it. And we talked about so many different principles of taking care of that. So then now we're going to talk about another case that, you know, I have seen throughout my career, um, you know, during my career. Um, so we had two nursing homes, your nursing home had two cases of COVID-19 um, only because you had a very effective respiratory protection program and PPE use and high hand hygiene compliance rates and early testing and surveillance strategy for respiratory illnesses, right? You're doing everything right, just what Erica talked about, and you're so proud of yourself, right? While well, you're sitting in the morning meeting and hear about two residents complaining about abdominal pain and the nurse is charting diarrhea. You test them for COVID-19 because you have seen you're so smart because this is, I have seen this happen and I'm sure you might have seen this happen as well because you've seen that sometimes diarrhea can be the only presenting symptom of COVID, right? So you're so focused on COVID and you are doing so well in that. So they are both negative for COVID. So what do you do now? Um, so here is the poll question. And I want you to tell me what you're gonna do now. Nothing, because they probably have eaten something bad in the food. Um, uh, you know, our residents love to complain about our food. Um, and then the other is isolate and watch. And the third option is isolate and investigate. Which one are you going to do? Yay. So yes, we are not gonna do nothing. Thank you for saying that. And then, um, the options are isolate and watch, and the other is isolate and investigate. And I'm so glad that 80% of us said, let's isolate and investigate. So what are the principles that you're following, right? The principles that you're following is, first of all, identifying that there is some clinical syndrome that is happening that should like go ding, ding, ding in our head, right? And then containment, immediately isolate, because you know whatever this is going on, even if it is nothing, even if it is bad food, right? We don't want it to spread because the chance of spread is so, super high and chance of people getting sick and us going into an outbreak is super duper high. So we're gonna, first thing, remember that towel, the paper towel um, scenario, we're gonna contain it. And then we're gonna say, hmm, what could it be, right? So what questions would you have when, there are these two people who are testing positive. What is the number and consistency of, consistency of stool? Because a lot of times we don't really talk about that. What are the symptoms that they have? Do they have abdominal pain? I'm gonna be right. Sure, I can kind of chime in here. So what other symptoms do they have? Where are they located in the building? Um, right, because we want to make sure that we're not going to potentially see other cases. Is this an outbreak? Is there this is something we should um, further be concerned about that should be high on our radar? Um, are there more residents with diarrhea? Again, kind of thinking about those red flags that would indicate that we really have a significant problem that we need to contain, not just with the resident, but across the facility. And then what are some other patient specific or resident specific factors that may uh, predis uh, that would, you know, basically predispose this uh, resident to have a potential diarrhea or some other clinical indications that um, indicate an infection or to something that is non infectious, but then just specific to the to the resident. Did you have anything else to add, Dr. Gar? Yeah, I think, you know, in this case, I will just say that, you know, what we found is actually after we mapped um, and we found that there were there was a resident who was actually admitted from the hospital with the with the history of um, C diff and was treated two weeks ago. So um, 
So that is what we found out after we mapped and they were admitted in that same hallway. Right. And, you know, that goes to the point of um, also, and we'll talk about this in the next few slides, about just kind of knowing that information, um, that interdisciplinary or interfacility communication um, that you should be re getting from a resident, uh, from uh, facilities to help inform, again, your risk of uh, infectious pathogens that may be coming with your residents, but also any type of risk um, for your facility. So again, in this situation, as you, you all mentioned, that you would go ahead, isolate, and investigate. And of course, this is, again, an example of a clinical situation, a clinical syndrome or condition that would warrant the need to go ahead and implement contact precautions because this is an enteric pathogen. And as Dr. Goffine told us that we subsequently will find out that this resident has C. diff. And this is, again, just having a high degree of suspicion and empirically implementing your transmission-based precautions. So again, empirically means that you're implementing um, these precautions in advance of actually getting a confirmatory diagnosis. So that way you're kind of covering your bases to prevent further transmission um, within your facility. And then, you know, if other subsequent testing or anything else comes back that indicates that uh, TBP is no longer appropriate or needed, then you can go ahead and discontinue. But again, as you see in this situation, this uh, diarrhea was actually infectious and could have been potentially spread throughout the unit. And so what will we do? We will go ahead and continue with our containment. We would go ahead and make sure that the signage is placed, it, placed appropriately within um, the, the, within the door and also that staff and residents and residents' family are also uh, familiar with the signage and know what to do. This is actually an excellent resource um, from our, um, um, our Alliant uh, Health webpage. Um, and I encourage you to check this out as well in addition to some other signs and uh, precaution signs that you may find helpful and um, easy to use in your facility. So um, well, next, let's talk about how we determine the extent of transmission. So this is a part of the investigation piece that you all pointed out so, so wonderfully. I'm so excited that you all did that because, yes, we need to investigate. And we do that through um, analyzing and reviewing our surveillance data. And surveillance is an essential part of the IPC program. Um, it's just collecting information to assess your risk factors. It's also identify in, um, infections and also identify how well certain things are working in your facility and what you need to improve. Now, active surveillance requires you to actively look for the infection or condition, uh, condition, and you're actually getting a more complete reporting and a complete picture when you're actively looking for infection. So in this situation, we might say, okay, well, we need to go ahead and actively look and investigate. So we probably need to go along the line of an outbreak investigation, which we'll also um, highlight in a moment. And then also um, passive surveillance is just when you collect data on a routine basis and you're on, and it's ongoing, and oftentimes you're going back retrospectively to look at the data versus collecting it real time. Either way, it's very important. Either uh, the path of uh, surveillance is important, but if you're really concerned about infection spreading your facility, active surveillance is the key. And there are different data sources you could use to help inform your um, assessments. So can you shift reports, pharmacy records, anything in the electronic medical record, laboratory data, uh, supervisor reports, employee health reports, interfacility documentation that would have been very critical in uh, Dr. Gar's scenario with the, the resident who came into our facility with C. diff. And then also any uh, type of RN or MDS coordinator assessments that may be, again, kind of show you or alert you to concerns that um, we might have an infectious pathogen in our facility. Data triggers like culture results, antibiotic starts, and of course, any type of clinical diagnoses, whether that's suspected, probable, or confirmed. Um, we need to go ahead and just, again, have a system where we're kind of catching these and identifying these potentially as red flags, especially if we're starting to see more of them. So again, this kind of brings us back to, okay, we in determining our extent of transmission, do we know? Do we think this is an outbreak? Because an outbreak actually represents an increase in what is normally expected, versus um, what you know, what you 
Yes, just basically what you normally expect. <laughs> um, but it's important because um, sometimes just even one case could be indicative of an outbreak. And so you need to ask these questions like, you know, what are factors in your facility that would increase our risk of an outbreak? What are factors in our community? What are our resident population factors? And then also, what data am I using to help inform if I, know, if, if I can tell if this is an outbreak or not? So you're usually going to do that with your IPC risk assessments, your facility data, and all also community level transmission and epidemiolo epidemiologic data. Also, again, it's very important as you're following through with identification and containment, making sure that you're verifying a diagnosis, especially if you're suspecting an outbreak is occurring, because again, you can kind of um, identify the pathogen and like your case definition, and then also work through an outbreak investigation very systematically to help get it under control. But again, outbreaks can occur with just a single case, for example, a COVID-19 case, Legionella, bacterial meningitis, all are case triggers for just an outbreak investigation, as well as anything determined by your public health department, any type of clusters or group of cases that occur in a particular place or unit, and then a pseudo outbreak, which just means that you're ha seeing more cases, but they're not actually uh, true uh, infections, but re most likely uh, related to process issues. And as Dr. Gar mentioned, it's very, very, very important that you're looking at this from a comprehensive standpoint, like a big picture, mapping out your cases. Like, are you noticing more triggers than usual in hall A or hall B or, you know, just with your staff. I mean, those are things that just kind of, again, help uh, alert you to your risk and what you need to contain. And when you're talking about outbreaks, it's very important, um, again, that you're mapping these out and looking at your triggers and um, getting more as much information as you can. And I will just highlight that we had an excellent uh, pre presentation focused just on steps of an outbreak investigation as they specifically relate to COVID-19, but also these principles can apply be applied to any type of infectious pathogen in your facility. And the link to that recording is here at the bottom of your screen. So now let's talk about our fourth and final step. It's coordinating your ongoing prevention activities. You need to make sure that you're um, uh, making sure that PPE is available, your signage is available, that you're designating equipment for residents, that you're also providing uh, for the, that particular resident who um, is in TBP, that you're completing uh, cleaning and disinfection, and that you also have a process and policy in place to help make sure that um, everyone knows how TBP is determined, knows who authorizes it, know, can understand who validates the appropriateness of TBP. And that's usually the IP should be involved in every point and every step of this. And I would like to, you know, uh, Dr. Garda chime in because it's definitely a collaborative effort with the medical director when it comes to this. Um, so in addition to that, just um, thinking about how you're auditing your processes too, to make sure that everyone is adhering to the TBP. Absolutely. I mean, I I was just writing myself a note to remind everyone that, you know, clearly you see that this is a interdisciplinary process, right? You know, when when we have residents who are going to therapy department and when we have residents in um, in TBP who, you know, diet dietary is coming in to check on the menus, um, your um, uh, people, you know, who are cleaning the room, right? Your um, uh, your professionals who are cleaning the room, uh, they are coming in to check, uh, you know, to to clean the room, and it is so incredibly important that there is close collaboration of, you know, what what either pathogen based or you know what kind of precautions that we have put in place. So I think you know it is such an important interdisciplinary collaboration that needs to happen in order to make sure that you have the you have the right kind of care that is being provided in order to prevent transmission i mean simple things like somebody walks in without a mask you know asking for the menu that that person could transmit to a large part of your building right they could get sick themselves um you know um pathogen based cleaning right you know if you have C, uh, C. diff uh, infection, which we did, right? And um, they don't, um, our um, cleaning professionals, they don't have the right cleaning supplies. 
then you know there is that chance of transmission that could happen in the facility. This facility, there was a transmission that happened based upon that pathogen, the C. diff, right? So those are the kind of things that we need to really, really um, start to think. How is therapy gonna handle? This person is coming in on part A, they do need therapy, right? Because you can't have ineffective therapy. How are you going to handle that? How is the therapy going to handle it without transmitting it further, right? So those are the things that that become incredibly important uh, when it comes to that. Also, one of the things that I will say is you've got to assign somebody. If you are putting you know, these transmission-based precautions, somebody has to be assigned. Somebody has to be the owner to make sure that these supplies are, are there, that the gloves are there, the gowns are there, the um, hand sanitizer is there, and they are in the appropriate places. The bins are there, you know, to make sure that people are throwing away the um, the PPE in the right places. So I think, you know, this this is beyond, let me just stick a, um, a you know, a, a transmission-based precaution sign. It is beyond that. It kind of takes over the whole operation of the facility. So I think those considerations are so, so, so important in order to make sure that people are doing the right thing. Absolutely. And to your point about audits, actually to the right of the slide here, you'll see a PPE uh, provision audit that you could easily print out and use from CDC to, again, help you um, identify any type of gaps in your processes related to TPP, TBP in your facility. All right, so we talked about a lot of things, and I think you know that the most important take-home messages is the following: have a high degree of suspicion, right? You know, if you are seeing something that especially is triggering based upon the outside environment, right? You gotta like say, okay, this could be the worst thing possible, right? You know, um, from from a transmission standpoint, and let me make sure that it is not that because that one thing that comes in can lead to like twenty cases in in the case of like COVID, right? So that was highlighted by that first um, first um, case that we talked about when the staff is walking in and they are saying that we have sniffles, get them tested in, right? Go test them. Um, so that is very, very, very important to identify at the very beginning. Containment is the second thing. Think about that like paper towel uh, scenario. Stop all transmission. That's the number one thing is I'm not going to wait until I find out what it is. I'm going to assume that this could be the worst because the risk to the other patients is so much. So I'm going to contain it and then I'm going to investigate, right? And how are we going to investigate? Can I just put another plug for active surveillance. Active surveillance, so, so, so important. Here's what I will tell you. A lot of times you're going to see the way that we have been able to, if we are able to keep the cases down during COVID, and this is like three years in the making, right? If we are able to keep the cases down in COVID, that is because we are doing immediate containment and active surveillance. So what does that mean? As soon as we have a case identified, the staff is going around. We created a checklist of uh, of symptoms that the staff is going to go and ask every single person and they are going to get tested. We, they are going, staff is going to ask every single um, uh, staff member and, and we are going to ask ourselves, do we have these symptoms? That's called active surveillance as opposed to passive where, you know what, what we do is we identify those cases early on, we contain them and the ongoing rolling spread doesn't happen as opposed to think about it, passive surveillance, Mrs. So-and-so doesn't feel good today. If you had asked her, she would have said that I feel weak, I don't feel super great. You would have tested her then, but we didn't. We decided to go passive surveillance and Mrs. So-and-so told us three days later that, oh, now I have a cough. She has been transmitting this illness for the last three days. So that is the difference between active and passive surveillance. And now you have a outbreak of 40 people instead of the 10, 10 to 15 people that you could have, you know, you could have been gotten away with. That's the difference between active and passive surveillance. Mapping, mapping, mapping. If you are an IP in a facility, if if we here is what needs to happen. Think about that second case. If the IP in the facility had basically said, okay, C. diff is transmissible, right? 
MDROs, my MDROs are transmissible. I have a photocopy of like um, uh, of my facility map. I'm going to actually do a color coded. I have a patient with C diff right here, and and then if somebody if the staff calls and says, "Oh, I am having Mr. So and So who is like one door down with diarrhea," that could have been contained there. So these cases, you know, I in my dreams, I have a, you know, my IP having a master plan of the building saying, these are the MDROs, these are the C diffs, these are the, you know, COVID cases, or these are the cases, or even the syndromes, right? On, and, and have a an global assessment of what you're dealing with. And that way you will be able to get to that containment, containment part faster. And then of course, risk assessment and audits as um, Erica has talked about. So this goes back to what Erica was telling you, right? You know, con syndrome, containment, determine the extent of transmission by active and passive surveillance, and then put this, uh, uh, you know, proper precautions and make sure that your EBS professional and other interdisciplinary team members know about it. So one of the things that, you know, so there are two big factors, right? You know, that that is going to, uh, you know, determine how transmission happens. There are resident risk factors, right? We know that MDROs are um, and and other infections um, are increased in recent antibiotic use. People who are requiring assistance with ADLs, people with indwelling medical devices, so 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 important. They are so highly susceptible to get the infections and catch these MDROs and then keep them. So super important. Let never it be said that a staff member tried to change the dressing of the PEG tube or the or handled a catheter without appropriate PPE. Um, urinary and fecal incontinence, so important. Shedding happens there, ulcers, and recent hospitalization. And I'll let Erica talk about the facility risk factors. Yeah, so um, there are a number of facility risk factors, and I know we're running low on time, but I won't go through all of them. I think it's really important. We'll talk about next month about the facility risk assessment, and it's important in identifying those factors. Um, and, you know, it's very important, what, too, that we understand why we need to be doing this. Yeah, and the reason is, first of all, patient safety. And, you know, the numbers are in, the, in there. Half of the people... Um, are going to have um, MRSA and gram-negative colonization. So our job in nursing home is to not spread. You know, people laugh about it. Uh, people jokingly say that hospitals give MDROs, nursing homes spread MDROs. I mean, not entirely clear, you know, true. But the bottom line is what it says is nursing homes can be these places because of the risk factors that we just talked about that MDROs can really spread. So we need to like come in with that, let's not spread them. The other important thing that I want to highlight here is that starting um, October of this year, we have started the performance period of this healthcare associated skilled nursing facility, healthcare associated value-based purchasing that is going to ultimately determine um, incentive payments and disincentive, you know, um, non-payments, right? So this is where we need to really, really get ahead to make sure that we are minimizing the health healthcare associated inf infections by minimizing transmission in our nursing facility. Absolutely. And, you know, a number of things that we could do from a quality improvement standpoint to help um, with that is implementing uh, root cause analyses, especially as it relates to new infections and outbreaks, and even just when we're observing low compliance with some of our uh, measures and audits, especially as it relates to TB, TBP and um, hand hygiene, et cetera. And I think this all just kind of close out that it all goes back to this 
this way of thinking about risk is called risk recognition. It just basically means that you're identifying the potential for a problem to happen before it has. And it's just also with in mind the awareness that things exist and naturally exist in your environment that could potentially harm your residents and staff. And that by being proactive on the front end and taking immediate action to identify those risks, prioritize them based on their impact, your readiness for them, and their potential harm to the residents, you can really have targeted mitigation strategies to help reduce the risk, um, like, again, implementing identifying pathogens, implementing um, TBT, very TBP, very timely, and then, of course, following up as needed to make sure that um, the risk is um, mitigated or just um, it no longer exists altogether. And I think that yeah, just and, ties back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. The fin finally, it is it is about, you know, how do you minimize the risk? And this is one of the examples that we take, you know, we developed at Alliant to make sure that we are able to see that risk and risk mitigation in a very global manner. And, the you know, so if we take it for either COVID or flu or RSV or anything that is a respiratory infection, right? This is these are the elements of risk mitigation that we are going to do in addition to we talked about how do we really kind of do containment and the last piece of it, it is risk mitigation and the risk mitigation is going to happen with high levels of immunization of these vaccine preventable illnesses in in your facility and I can tell you the two in in the recent uh, times, the two people who have been admitted to the hospital with COVID from our nursing home are the two people who were not vaccinated. So these are important strategies to make sure to communicate with the patients and say, this is gonna really prevent you from getting super ill. Um, and then infection prevention and control that we talked about, and also consideration for therapeutics. So when the flu season comes around, Tamiflu, but you know, even for COVID, think about the therapeutics. So these are these are the important strategies, but these are basic principles, general principles that will take you, you know, make you really, really super effective in limiting the spread of trans, you know, illnesses that can be transmitted within the nursing home, infectious diseases, and, and also risk mitigating some of these, um, in some of these areas. So this is probably the last slide and we did run over a little bit, but here's what I would say. We are coming back in to, in, at the end of the um, month, next month, talking about some illnesses that even spread further, like some skin infections and um, and that are really insidious in spread. So we are going to come back. You guys need to come back as well if you uh, want to hear about that and talk more about that. Come with questions. It is your session. And if you need us to talk about any other illness that you have seen spread or you have any other cases, please, by all means, let us know. And we'll be happy to um, you know talk about those cases as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Um, we do. Ha we did have a few questions that were answered in the chat. I do want to also uh, just let you all know that the slides for today's sessions will be posted in the next coming days. So please just check out the link that was provided in the webinar chat um, in the next few days to get a link to the slides and the resources that were here. And with that, um, you can reach out to us, the patient safety team at alliantehealth.org. And again, we just want to thank you for all of the work you do on a daily basis to help keep your residents and staff safe. And again, reach out to um, us uh, here at Alliant or your, um, your uh, quality advisors uh, or state program uh, managers if you have any other questions related to um, our content today. So thank you.